there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tepalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tepalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. Tefl News. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about a piece of news that I read recently. <laughs> okay. Uh, the headline is, Iran bans teaching of English in primary schools. Have either mm. of you heard about this uh, yes. piece of news? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm. Right. <laughs> Um, so basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, I think, from what I could tell, in Iranian schools, um, English is a subject that's introduced uh, almost uh, across the board in secondary schools, um, but a lot of primary schools also teach it. A lot of uh, private schools uh, teach, private primary schools teach English, mm. and a lot of public schools teach uh, English too. Um, but basically, it's been banned. You're not allowed to. Okay. Even if you yeah, that's to. what I was going to ask for. <clears throat> Not just removed from the syllabus. No. Banned. It's illegal to teach English to primary school wow. students. And what? So who who made it illegal? Which body? Um, the the Iran's High Education Council. Mm-hmm. Um, Mehdi Nabid Adam. I'm sure my pronunciation is terrible, but he's the chief of Iran's High Education Council, and he's the one who informed the state television of the ban. Um, the the supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei Khamenei mm. not sure if that's it, um, mm-hmm. apparently has previously expressed concern about um, the amount of or the extent of English language education mm-hmm. in Iran. and it's just the primary just a primary school right so okay. it's it's still it's not it's not an all, all out ban mm. um, but the you know one of the phrases that was used was cultural invasion mm. and um, I don't want to or have the ability to get into the any of the you know geopolitical aspects of this in too much detail, um, but it, I think the, the the supreme leader and, and the Iranian government has um, previously expressed, um, you know, n- not wanting too much Western values or, or the, those kinds of things in Iranian culture. Mm. This is maybe one example of it, um, but I think it's it's interesting, um, and and other things they they said was. They, they think that doing this will be a way of strengthening Persian language skills mm-hmm. and, per, and Iranian and Islamic culture in the country. Um, this is a, I don't know, argument or, or thing that you sometimes hear, we sometimes hear in Japan, mm. um, this idea that, you know, when there's debates about, you know, when should English be taught to school children, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, if they teach them too early, then that's mm. going to detract from their Japanese language skills. Yeah, which is not true which is, <laughs> as far as we know is not true yeah there's no evidence for that at all but i mean that's all in this case i think it's i well i, I was gonna say it's obviously not that that's like a Mm-mm-mm. not the real reason mm-hmm. that's kind of an excuse yeah. um but i don't i don't know how how uh, strongly i want to say that's obviously not the, <laughs> yes. the reason it's what i would suspect <laughs> so uh, other things that the the supreme leader has said so he's talked about as i mentioned before this, this idea of a western cultural infiltration Mm. Um, he says he said that the language of science is not necessarily English. Um, he has suggested uh, students learn primary school students taught be taught other languages, mm. including Spanish, French, or other Eastern languages. Um, so it's obviously very specifically about English. Yeah. Um, this idea of a cultural invasion, though, or you know, English as a type of cultural invasion, um, it reminded me of something that Reiko Yoshihara said in mm. the panel discussion at the, from our JAL presentation. I think she asked um, Hugh Starkey this idea of, you know, I think she, she expressed that maybe she felt, occasionally she felt a, a little conflicted that it, by teaching English, is she then promoting Western values? Mm. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, so Robert Philipson, in his linguistic imperialism sort of thesis, uh, he... I mean, th- this is part of um, what he talks about in that. So mm-hmm. I think early on in the book, he talks about the different uh, kind of 
arguments that have been made in terms of linguistic um, or language playing a part in cultural imperialism. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one group that he talks about that was very against English linguistic imperialism particularly was the Nazis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's it's reasonable because I think you know you can't you can't. Well, maybe well depends what the English as a lingua franca people say, but um, at the moment, the way that English language teaching is done at the moment, it does generally include, maybe implicitly, cultural values to some extent. Uh, but again, it depends how it's carried out. I don't think it has to, right? but I think that it often does. Is that, do you mean, or is that generally meant by, um, just in, in, the, in the context of teaching a language, certain values are kind of expressed? Or is the idea that there's something inherent in the language that carries those values? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily inherent in the language. Mm. Um, but I think that when you, like, if you're a teacher teaching a language, then you, you know, there, there are some things that when you teach it, you might, you know, put across a particular idea mm-hmm. um, because that idea is connected to something that you're teaching or to one of your experiences or to something like that. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it does depend more on how you teach it. I don't know, what do you think would be inherent in a language that would be cultural? You'd have idioms and stuff, I guess, which would then uh, be culturally based. Um, I suppose, yeah. Although, at the same time, I mean, they, they would be culturally based, but not necessarily... I, I don't think they would necessarily carry certain values that mm. are specific or more inherent in the culture than other. Yeah. yeah. Like, this, this uh, news article is about the banning of English, mm-hmm. but it's written in English. And it's, you know, in a, in a sense that that'll be expressing ideas which are not in the best interests of English. Right. So, yeah, I think you, you can have language not connected to cultural values. And I think that's what people uh-huh. have tried to do, like with, so L.A. Hill that we talked about um, mm-hmm. a few episodes ago with his uh, neutral English or mm-hmm. Randolph Quirk, who we might talk about later, mm-hmm. with his um, nuclear English and then the modern English as lingua franca movement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, this is naive to ban English because it's... Well, firstly, one question I had is what what is their understanding of English? Because, yeah, like we talked about before, there are different Englishes. Yeah. To just right. ban English as a, a one mm. mono language is that's yeah. naive and. I can. I mean, I can see it as them thinking that you know, English being the primary foreign language that is learned, um, and for whatever reasons, it often ends up in most countries that it's kind of you know people people of better means who end mm. up learning English yeah. better and, you know, being, begin, becoming better English. So it may be, you know, seen as an elite language and it also may, may be seen connected to like aspirations of becoming more Western or moving to the West. Mm. So I can, I can see it. Mm. I can see them feeling that it's going to play a part in Westernizing their country. Right. Yeah. And I mean, like, I don't like the idea of banning anything. Sure. Um, and especially not a language, you know, <laughs> or the teaching of a language at least. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, if if the if they don't want English to be taught, mm. it seems that you know the fact that English is being taught is more of a kind of a market thing. You know, people want English, so schools yeah. teach English. Yeah. And you know, you can say, well, we'll promote other languages. We'll promote. But do you think that it's actually possible to remove the influence of English without some very strong political action, like a ban? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. How does how how do you think a ban would actually play out because these children or their families are still going to find ways to teach English. Was well, in schools specifically, right? But they'll, they'll find ways private schools, you know, they'll, it will yeah. still be... Private tutoring it, or Yeah, something. it will still be around them and, it's, and it is. There's no escaping that English is a, a world language that's, that's used yeah. as a lingua franca, so... It will be there anyway, so banning something is... Right. Will, will maybe only intensify their desire to <laughs> yeah. try and learn it maybe. possibly yeah yeah i think the idea that you brought up about world english is that's very that's very interesting mm-hmm. because it does i mean you know the political reason for getting rid of english would be you know as you say uh, cultural imperialism but i mean they're not worried about you know indian cultural imperialism right or um, jamaican cultural so, imperialism so, yeah, or nigerian so, cultural imperialism yeah, so that's why i said course, it, it, yeah, it depends yeah. on what their definition of english is and right. i think their definition is probably one of um Inner circle, mm. you yeah, know, and that those kind of norms of English, maybe. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Also, another question is: pro- primary education is a limited amount of time. What happens after primary education? 
are they allowed to learn English then? Or? They are. They just start it later. They just start it later. Mm. Well, there's arguments so the for that. There's, yeah, yeah, there's you know, arguments there's, that that's a, <laughs> it's a better results anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it may be a just a, a, a thing to kind of... They, they may not have much practical... Mm. They, may not, they may be aware that there's not much practical... Benefits yeah. of this, but it's just a, a statement. A statement, yeah. 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 Tefl cultures. Okay, so for this week's uh, Tefl cultures, I'd like to talk about a, a similar topic mm-hmm. to, to what Matt talked about. It's um, a new kind of way of approaching English uh, put forth by Akmar Makboob. And this is actually taken from an article that's not actually released yet. However, it's been personally kind of um, spread by Makboob himself okay. on Twitter and he's provided a link to it, which I looked at. Um, and, and the name of the article is Beyond Global Englishes, Teaching English as a Dynamic Language. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're going to talk about this. So the premise of... Um, MacBoob's argument is that most approaches to language in ELT focus on types of language variation or still adhere to norm-based descriptions, Mm -hmm. such as native speaker Englishes, for example, that kind of thing. But they fail to take into account the dynamic nature of language with teacher education, pedagogical materials and curricular approaches not reflecting dynamicity okay <laughs> which he which he wrote um so address this uh, macbu puts forth the teaching of english as a dynamic language as a potential approach mm-hmm. so i'll i'll go through the article and then we'll discuss it afterwards if that's okay so mm-hmm. macbu begins by talking about the dimensions of language variation uh, what well, firstly what do you think they might be uh well i mean so is this a kind of like intercultural skills or is it or is it more to do with the the Actual linguistic elements um, of the language? The socio-semiotic elements. Okay, so intercultural <laughs> is what I think. <laughs> right, I mean, I could, that could include things like accent and register. Mm. And yeah, yeah, so, yeah, more broadly, he talks about user-oriented features. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that kind of yeah. covers that. Use-oriented features. Mm-hmm. Uh, mode-oriented features. Okay. And time mm. as well. So, yeah, I, like you said, accent would perhaps be a user oriented feature mm. use oriented the purpose of the english mm. maybe the discourse um it's and, almost like functional notional yeah yeah this is where all, this is this is all based on halliday's work right yeah so mm. it all stems from that and um yeah i did have some examples for example mode could be written or oral like and it encompasses every day or the technical for example mm. and user is in line with the local or the global user mm-hmm. i guess and that's yeah. it that, yeah, what do you think that means, global or local user? Is this uh, another way to hedge the native, the international user? Well, I'd have thought a local would be a, some someone using the language internationally as a form of communication within a country, whereas the global would be more of an intercultural kind of mm. Between thing. people from different national or linguistic or cultural backgrounds. Or a family in Manchester talking with one another in yeah. English. <laughs> As, okay. as a local. That, that's a local one. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah no. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. For example. Yeah. But even even in that in that situation, there may be global elements. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And um, Maccabi then plots and explores these dimensions through eight domains of language. So one one domain. I won't talk about all of them, but one uh-huh. domain is the local, oral, specialized. Mm-hmm. And an example of that is members of an indigenous community talking about the local weather system. Mm, like in Manchester. Like in Manchester. <laughs> um, another domain is the global oral everyday, and that could be casual conversation amongst people from different parts of the world. Okay, but in Manchester, specifically. It could be in Manchester, yeah. It doesn't, does, that could play out anywhere, I guess. Yes, but, yeah. um, so he talks about the dimensions of language variation, and then he talks about the descriptions and studies of language variation. So he explains how scholars are currently describing language variation through formal variations, um, such as the phonetic, the phonological, the morphological, like we talked about earlier, Mm. uh, the syntactic, semantic and pragmatic features of language. Mm -hmm. And he then goes on to talk about how they're studying this. Mm. So they're describing it and how they're studying it. And um, he talks about some of the research that's been done. I think he mentioned Larson Freeman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea of dynamic systems theory yeah. to illustrate how languages could be thought of as a complex adaptive system. Yeah, that's uh, one of those books that's on my shelf that I will never read. Or CAS, CAS, 
as it, yeah. Yeah, um, so for example, language can be thought of as an emergent, self-organizing, open, feedback, sensitive, and unfinalizable, mm-hmm. and inseparable from context, and it's variable. Mm-hmm. Right. So kind of describing language, not as this one kind of stuck kind of thing, yep. singular item, mm-hmm. as, a, as a kind of a thing that's always in flux. Right. But, so that's how they're currently studying this within okay. the world lang- world Englishes and ELF kind of um, okay. tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, MacBoob then puts forth the dynamic approach to language proficiency, the DALP. So this is where in his paper he moves into the practical and he talks about how this could be a model that's needed um, to describe language proficiency and how to measure language as a complex adaptive system. Mm-hmm. And he puts forth this model. So directly quoting from the article, Dalp argues that being proficient in a language implies that we are sensitive to the setting of the communicative event and have the ability to select, adapt, negotiate, and use a range of linguistic resources that are appropriate in the context. Mm. And he talks about a way of measuring how you go about doing this. Okay. So he talks about four zones. He talks about a zone of expertise, a zone of expanding experience, a zone of expanding code, and the last one, which I like, zoned out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so anyway, so he, he talks about this model towards language, and, in the, and then finally he sum, summarises by talking about his implications to lang- like the language classroom. Mm. So he talks about testing. The, um, language tests can require test takers to demonstrate their ability to negotiate variations in language. Okay, so tests could include a diverse range of texts and contexts and designed to assess an individual's ability to negotiate variations. Mm. And he also talks about the, the re-evaluating the native speaker models, which everyone's trying to do these yeah. days, and um, looking at materials as well. Yeah. That's his basic premise. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of had two conflicting reactions actually okay. listening to that. So first, my first reaction was to think... Um, isn't this something? Do like? Do we need to teach people this? Like, isn't this something that people naturally? These are skills people naturally develop in yeah, using a language yeah. in a range of settings. Um, and doesn't it give you a bit too much to teach? Mm. You know, trying to adapt your teaching to to suit all of these different things. Is it mm. something you can actually do in the classroom? But then I was also thinking um, that recently I've had a couple of experiences where, like, um, so I was with my father-in-law. And I had like, you know, a 40 minute conversation in Japanese and that was fine. Um, and then a bit later with my family, we went to a restaurant and I completely failed to interact on a very basic level with the waiter. Mm-hmm. And that was just to do with the contextual yeah. specificity of the thing. So I, and maybe that's not exactly what Mike was talking about here, but, mm. but I think, yeah, yeah. I, I can see how it would be useful having more of a, so that the, kind of approach. The bit, the bit for right. me, like the theoretical stance on this is, is strong. Mm. But then the implications of the classroom are the weak, the yeah, weaker right. part of this essay. Maybe I just didn't quite understand the the, the basic idea that language is dynamic and and always changing and evolving and is yeah. used differently in different circumstances. I think the the main idea kind of hidden in all of that is he wants more people to view language as complex adaptive systems rather than they. I think he wants to re-describe or. It, I mean, it sounded to me like yeah. he's trying to create a framework for what you're talking about mm-hmm. there, not just saying, ooh, it's all there, but yeah. like, ha- like actually codify it and put down a systematic way of analysing well, had that. He talks about it in terms of language proficiency, so yeah. me- measuring, and he said there's no standardised tests mm. that test the somebody's dynamic awareness of language. Right. So there are tests that will test different, for example, different registers and different, mm. you know, writing an informal letter versus writing a... Formal, you know, formal letter. It's, right. Those yeah. kinds of things yeah. are are tested. Yeah, so I'm mean, wondering he, what exactly he mentions ESP a lot in this right. English right, for right, specific right. purposes. So being aware of English for different things, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it seems like this article is, as I struggle to describe it, it it's purely theoretical in the descriptions, and mm-hmm. it, I don't know. It doesn't seem to trickle down neatly to the classroom. Mm. I don't think. Well, I mean, it sounds like yeah. it's a first step down a road, but I mean, it also sounds like it's a, a new way of framing a lot of issues that we already know about. Yeah. Mm. Um, which is fine, you know, that, that could lead us to new yeah. insights about those issues. Yeah. Uh, but And I like, I mean, I like the assessment angle. I like, mm. you know, recognising that if, if it is going to become 
a new frame, or if there is a new framework to to be developed there, yeah. that it should we should be able to apply it to assessment as well. So, so there were a few transcripts in this essay where mm-hmm. he he showed the examples of language as a kind of a complex system. Mm-hmm. But what I'd like to see more is how this um, DALP dynamic approach to language proficiency, mm. the actual not grading criteria, but I'd like to see how somebody has been assessed using that. Mm. Yeah. If indeed they do assess them using this, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, it sounds like the argument is for more local, locally focused teaching and testing, right? Um, if if like if I mean, when I say locally focused, for specifically contextually bound. Mm. So if someone's going to be in a particular area, then you teach them to operate in that particular area, and you test their ability to operate in that particular area. Mm-hmm. And if you want to test like. I mean, you can't. You it would be, I think, pretty much impossible to design a test that figured out whether you were proficient in communicating in every possible potential context. Of course, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I wonder. Like, I mean, language. One point of teaching language is to make it teach people building blocks so that it can be kind of generative and adaptive, right? Mm -hmm. The the idea is that you you don't have to teach absolutely everything that Mm -hmm. could possibly happen within the language, Mm -hmm. but that you can teach enough that people can then adapt those tools and function in different areas. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much this would have actual implications for the classroom, more in terms of just raising awareness of students that this is the case. Like, if, if I teach you this language... It might you could use this here, but in a different context, you you might use a different phrase. But we already do that, don't we? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's today's TEFL culture. Um, reassessing language, I guess, as a dynamic language. English as a dynamic language. TEFL pioneers. Today's TEFL pioneer is Randolph Quirk. Are you familiar with Randolph Quirk? Uh, not very. No. I'm, I... So. Uh, he's he's a very interesting guy. Um, he actually passed away uh, on the twentieth of December last year, um, twenty seventeen, uh-huh. at the age of ninety seven, which is pretty pretty good going. Mm. So he was born which year? Nineteen ten. No. <laughs> Idiot. Hang on. Nineteen seventeen. Nineteen oh three. He was. Oh, Hang on. No 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 sorry. Nineteen twenty three. Nineteen twenty. In 1920, right. he was born. He died on my birthday. Oh, happens. really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know how old I was? Happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I have here uh, a couple of obituaries to him. Um, we'll talk about his life and his work uh, and um, some of the influences that he had and some of the major projects he was involved with. Um, so, uh, yeah, so he was born on the 12th of July, 1920, uh, at Lamfell on the Isle of Man hmm. um, to a farming family. Hmm. Um, and he uh, attended high school on the island, um, and then he went to University College London, so quite a change from his farming background, although he said that his farming background taught him the value of hard work, um, and that made him kind of interested in uh, his academic work, very focused on his academic work. So he started studying there in 1939, um, but in 1940, uh, his studies were interrupted um, because he went to join uh, the Bomber Command in the RAF. Um, and he became a squadron leader in the RAF. And he became so interested in explosives that he started a second degree in chemistry, (laughs) which is quite interesting. Um, But uh, he went back to English. Um, So he studied at UCL from 1945 to 1947, um, and then he started a junior lectureship at the university uh, until 1952, during which time he completed an MA in phonology and a PhD in syntax. So very specific kind of subject areas. Um, and then he became a postdoctoral Commonwealth Fund Fellow at Yale University and Michigan State a what University. Fellow? A fund fellow. A fund fellow. Oh, a, fund fellow. Right. a postdoctoral Commonwealth Fund Fellow. At where? Uh, Yale and University of Michigan, or Michigan State University, I mm-hmm. should say. Um, and eventually he returned to UCL as professor in 1960. And in 1968, uh, he became Quain Professor which uh, I guess is named after a very famous UCL professor or something, or a famous <laughs> linguist or something, um, until 1981, which was when he retired. Hmm. So he was very influential in linguistics and in applied linguistics. Um, according to the tribute on the UCL website, every student and academic who studies the English language will be aware of and will have been influenced by his seminal work into the written and spoken word 
apart from apparently you two. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Professor David Crystal, uh-huh. uh, an, a previous pioneer, yep. um, said that Randolph Quirk defined English language studies for the second half of the 20th century. Hmm. I don't know of any English language scholar who doesn't owe a debt to him because of something he did. He has that unparalleled influence. Wow. <laughs> um, so, uh, actually, um, a very good example of this is... Uh, David Crystal. Mm. So David Crystal says that when he was beginning his studies, um, he was actually losing interest in English until he suddenly... Well, he had a a lecture uh, with Randolph Quirk. um, And he said... So he was in two minds about whether to continue uh, with English language at University College London. um, But... uh, Because the lectures weren't very interesting. um, But then Baron Quirk arrived. (laughs) says, he came in in my second year, he gave us one lecture, and I was a convert. He blasted into the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was down to his magnetism, his enthusiasm and charisma. He had it. There's no question about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for Randolph Quirk, we wouldn't have had David Crystal. So, there you go. There's, uh, well, we said we've had him, but not in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he had. Uh, he was involved in two very important um, uh, projects during his life, which were connected. The first one was the survey of English usage. Mm. So this was um, a, a survey of all of the forms of spoken and written English. So with a few different people, including David Crystal, mm-hmm. um, they collected a million words of text from a variety of different sources in order to get... Um, an accurate picture of what English was like. Uh, And this was published eventually in a book called The Comprehensive Grammar of the English Language. Mm. So this was the first time this had been done, where an accurate description, not based on kind of formal registers, an accurate description of the ways in which English was used, um, was was done. Um, So uh, the survey was produced between 1955 and 1985. Mm -hmm. um, And slightly confusingly, uh, I've got two different sources here. One of them says that the, cor- the corpus provi- uh, comprised 200 texts, each of 5,000 words. Mm-hmm. And another one said that it was 500 texts, each of 2,000 <laughs> words. Oh. But, it, but anyway, the point was, it was a million words in the end. Um, and these were dialogues, monologues, lots of different samples of English from lots of different sources. Um, and as I say, uh, a comprehensive grammar of the English language was produced in mm-hmm. the 1980s. Yeah. Um, so that was very, very important. Um, and that will have had, of course, an influence on language teaching, I think, uh, in terms of understanding different registers and that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and researching about Randolph Quirk, this is what I learned about him, was about the survey for English usage. But um, the thing that I'd heard about him, or, or the, the area where he'd influenced me the most mm. uh, in my studies, was a debate that he had with another previous pioneer, Raj Katru, mm. who also passed away recently. Mm. Have you heard about the debates? I can't remember the the crux of the argument was, but I imagine it was to do with um, Katru seeing English um, as an expanding world English and Quirk saying the opposite, <laughs> saying sta- we need a standardised form of English. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so, so I do know about him. Yeah. So, yeah, so this went on for a little while. It's reproduced in the book uh, Controversies in Applied Linguistics, yeah. edited by Barbara Zeidelhofer, a previous interviewee. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, basically, Katru was, was promoting the idea of a kind of a, a, a plurality of Englishes, world mm-hmm. Englishes, um, and Quirk was very much focused on standard English. Okay. And not, as, not dynamic at all. Not dynamic. Like in dynamicity. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, his survey of English usage, he was interested yeah, yeah. in the dynamicity of right. language, but he did think that it was very important to have a standard. Mm. Um, and he actually, uh, so another one, another concept that he brought up, that which uh, I mentioned earlier during your segment, Matt, was um, nuclear English, mm-hmm. which was identifying the core features of the language which remain the same across different registers mm. and varieties, mm-hmm. um, which he thought was the you know, kind of the the core, the nucleus of the language. Yep. And he thought that was very important to to identify so that you could teach. Mm. Um, so that plays mm. into the idea of a standard language. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very similar to L.A. Hill's uh, uh, neutral English as well. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And, yeah, and, so, and that's been very important, very influential on English as a lingua franca mm. studies. Uh, yeah. Jennifer Jenkins writes about it in her okay. 2000 book. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's just some some uh, background on Randolph Quirk. I mean, how do you think knowing that, hearing about that, how do you think he's influenced ELT? Yeah. I mean, maybe again, like the when you talk about the debate with with Castro, it 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 feels more like he would influence people like textbook writers, materials mm. writers. Um, who are looking for ways of chopping language up and deciding what, like what to teach first and all those kind of things. Right. All all things which kind of, you know currently are maybe considered a little out of date. Mm. Um, but I think are maybe still an important stepping stone to where we are now. Right. 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 So That's yeah, it. going back to that. So I don't. He wasn't. Dis- he wasn't saying that there aren't other lang- Englishes of use in the world. No. He was trying to measure them against the standard. Right. Whereas yeah. Kashru was trying to argue for the for those being English as in their own right. Mm. I think rather than on a on a cline of how how good how the English, English they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. yeah. so I think that's um I think he's he's kind of the the person that's most known for arguing that because mm-hmm. of this debate yeah, with yeah, Kashru yeah. perhaps. Um but yeah, I think we, you know, uh, he he's had an influence in lots of different areas, um, and even if we don't realise it, perhaps the all of the work that he did in linguistics, in language study, mm. that's influenced, you know, aspects of the profession that perhaps we're not even aware of. Mm. Um, so uh, actually, uh, one interesting thing I want to mention: the obituary in the Guardian was written by Geoffrey Leach. Have you heard of Geoffrey Leach? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's another very famous linguist. So this was the obituary written. He also dies. He he died, yeah, it says at the end, he died in 2014, yeah. so three years before the obituary was published. So I guess they must have asked him to write the obituary in advance, yeah, and yeah. then, yeah, it was kind of interesting, I thought. Yeah, yeah so, um, so yeah, uh, so it's kind of sad news, um, Randolph Quirk's passed away, but uh, a very influential figure in applied linguistics and linguistics, language study, um, and our pioneer for this episode. Thank you very much for listening today. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with us, please send an email to teflology at gmail.com. You can also follow our Facebook page, uh, follow us on Twitter at teflology, and we have a website, teflology podcast.com, where you can uh, download all of our previous episodes. And we also have a book available, Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, which can be purchased from amazon.com or amazon.anything. Um, and uh, from Smashwords uh, it's very reasonably priced and it's good so please download that so it's goodbye from me goodbye from me goodbye